The FBI is understandably proud of its long tradition of solving crimes. It is undoubtedly one of the more accomplished agencies in the world at performing crime-solving tasks. In its over 100 years of existence, it has only failed one time to solve a case of air piracy, the infamous D.B. Cooper case. On the Wednesday before Thanksgiving Day in 1971, a man calling himself Dan Cooper boarded a midday Northwest Orient flight in Portland, Oregon, bound for Seattle, Washington. The plane was a Boeing 727. Cooper had paid $18.52 cash for the ticket. The flight took off on schedule at 2.50 p.m. Passenger Cooper was well dressed in a black suit, white shirt, and black tie with a pearl tie pin. He had in his possession a briefcase and ordered a bourbon and soda and lit a cigarette. Not long after takeoff, he motioned a flight attendant over and handed her a note. She assumed the note was his telephone number and put it in her pocket without looking at it. Cooper then said to her, quote, Miss, you'd better look at that note. I have a bomb, end quote. Nervously, she opened the note, and it read, I have a bomb in my briefcase. I will use it if necessary. I want you to sit next to me. You are being hijacked. The flight attendant sat down next to Cooper and asked him to show her the device. He opened his briefcase slightly, and she saw wires, a battery, in red cylinders. He gave her his demands, which included $200,000 in American currency, four parachutes, and for the plane to be refueled in Seattle. The air hostess gave the note to the captain, who quickly relayed the information to the control tower in Seattle. They contacted the FBI, as well as the airline, to alert all pertinent parties to the ongoing situation. In the interest of passenger safety, the president of Northwest Airlines agreed to pay the ransom, provide the parachutes, and instructed his employees to cooperate with the hijacker. The captain made an announcement indicating that because of a minor mechanical issue, landing would be delayed. The plane circled Puget Sound for two hours to allow Cooper's demands be met and emergency personnel to assemble at the airport. The FBI assembled 10,000 unmarked $20 bills from the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco and recorded all the serial numbers. The money and parachutes were assembled, and shortly after 5.30 p.m., the plane landed. At Cooper's direction, it taxied to a remote runway, and the money and parachutes were delivered to the hijacker. Once he had confirmed that all the money was there, he released all the passengers and one of the flight attendants. Cooper demanded that they fly toward Mexico City, but when the co-pilot informed him that they would have to refuel before entering Mexican airspace, he changed the destination to Reno, Nevada. Unknown to Cooper, two F-106 fighter jets from McCord Air Force Base shattered the flight from above and below, far enough away to be unseen. He ordered the flight attendant to join the flight crew in the cockpit. At around 8 p.m., a warning light came on indicating that the aft staircase door had been opened, a fact verified by the cabin pressure. At 8.13, during a heavy rainstorm, Cooper lowered the aft stairs and jumped out over southwest Washington, never to be seen again. At 10.15, the plane landed in Reno where the FBI recovered two of the four parachutes and 66 fingerprints that were never matched to any in fingerprint databases. The FBI agent in charge of the case from 1971 to 1980, Ralph Himmelsbach, said he believes Cooper died in the jump. He said, quote, I can't say that it wasn't survivable, but it's unlikely. That airliner was going 170 knots at 10,000 feet. Outside air temperature was 7 degrees below zero with a chill factor of 69 degrees below zero, end quote. If the Bureau's belief is that Cooper perished during the jump, what happened to his body, clothes, parachutes, 
money, etc. The official explanation is that his body was eaten by wild animals and his clothes, parachute, and the money was destroyed by the elements. The investigation of the event continued for years. With little evidence left behind, the FBI struggled to generate much information that could close the case forever. FBI modeling suggested that Cooper's descent would place him at Lake Merwin, close to Ariel, Washington. Washington police conducted door-to-door -door inquiries in the area, along with air, foot, and boat searchers. Nothing showed up. At the end of 1972, all serial numbers of the ransom money was released to the public, to no avail. Rewards were offered, and again, nothing concrete emerged. Since the hijacking, the FBI has investigated more than a thousand persons as possible suspects, including a World War II veteran, a mass murderer, a criminal, and a university professor. The last significant break in the crime occurred on February 10, 1980, when an eight-year-old boy found 294 decaying $20 bills on the banks of the Columbia River, five miles northwest of Vancouver, Washington. Serial numbers confirmed the bills to be part of Cooper's ransom money. None of the other 9,710 $20 bills have ever been found. Special Agent Larry Carr, who took over as head of the investigative team in 2006, had this to say about the investigation. Quote, We originally thought Cooper was an experienced jumper, perhaps even a paratrooper. We concluded after a few years this simply was not true. No experienced parachutist would have jumped in the pitch black night, in the rain, with a 200 mile per hour wind in his face, wearing loafers and a trench coat. It was simply too risky. Diving into the wilderness without a plan, without the right equipment, in such terrible conditions, he probably never even got his chute open." End quote. Evidence would suggest that Cooper, whoever he might have been, died on that fateful night in 1971. However, there will be many who disagree, as other theories have surfaced over the years. One of the more recent theories involves a Vietnam veteran named Robert Rackstraw. A History Channel documentary came to the conclusion that Rackstraw was indeed D.B. Cooper. Mr. Rackstraw was never indicted or admitted to being Cooper. He died in 2019, taking the truth with him to his grave. It is likely that no one will ever know for sure who D.B. Cooper actually was or if he died the night of the jump. Some mysteries are just not destined to be conclusively solved. If you enjoyed this video, give a thumbs up, make a comment, and most importantly of all, subscribe to the channel. As always, thanks for watching.